Hey, this is Sabrina Monarch of monarchastrology.com bringing you the astrology forecast for December 14th to December 20th, 2022. I am coming back from quite the sabbatical year, so help me breathe life back into this YouTube channel by liking this video, subscribing to this channel, hitting the notification bell so that you know when new videos come out, and leaving a comment at some point just to say hello, if not to also let me know what resonated with you or how you're doing. This week, Mercury and Venus are in Capricorn. They each aspect Chiron and Aries this week, suggesting that we may be inclined toward pragmatic actions and boundaries, Capricorn, that facilitate a deeper sense of self-respect. This need not limit be uh, limited just to our respective self, but also how we're showing up in a way that we feel like we're integrity with life and with our relationships. The vision of how to do that when coming from an immature, um, uninitiated or wounded part of the self, so thinking here about part of the spectrum of Chiron and Aries, um, acting out of self-respect would obviously look a lot different if it's coming from the immature, uninitiated or wounded part of self than if these visions were to emerge from the true, empowered, mature, integral, etc. aspect of the self. The Aries Capricorn square in of itself has taught me how one can do the right, you know, quote, right things and end up in a place of control where one knows how to behave appropriately, but masks other impulses that are happening internally. Like when we want to throw a tantrum, but we act with the utmost decorum instead, you know, self-control or retreat from conflict can be skillful skillful or wise, you know, but there can also be deep-rooted patterns of just masking, behaving in a certain way, um, and that not really being fully authentic, right? When we restrict the spontaneous expression of being ourself so that we can appear put together or not look like a total fool, idiot, insert judgmental name here, right? Aries is not afraid in of itself to look like a fool because Aries is driven by impulses that are entirely new to the self. If not also like, I'm the first one in this environment that's going out on a limb here to say or do this thing. I just feel it bubbling up within me and I'm just going to go for it. And there's an inherent insecurity in that. There's a charmingness of this too. Like other people look to it as like, wow, that's bold or that's brave or that's, um, inventive right where that gives me permission but the capricorn side like capricorn is a lot more energetically conservative a lot more um related to history and what's tried and true and what's been shown over time um what's culturally valued sometimes as conventional or normal or within a particular industry or field or subculture this is the way things have been done this is the way to be um, and so that Aries Capricorn square is that tension between I'm just going to go do the thing that's bubbling up inside of me and is emerging, or I'm going to be strategic and do the right thing, the thing that I know over time to be skillful. What's beyond simply acting appropriately and repressing the inappropriate from a place of control is initiating the parts of self that are younger, that are in pain, that have some unmet need. It would be consulting the grandmother tree, the wise person, and or a rooted place of wisdom within and considering how to handle the turbulent emotions or life impasse responsibly. Not just responsibly in terms of doing the right thing in the eyes of society, but what would actually be responsible spiritually in the unfolding life of the soul having this incarnate experience. And as we have breakthroughs in this arena, deeper and more grounded love and a depth and capacity for love is met. So I'll get into our week. I'll break down the particular transits in more detail after a few announcements. One is that um, getting on my mailing list is a great way to stay in touch. This is where I tend to announce my books being open, or it, it's where I announce my books being open. I announce it there first. Um, so if spots fill, they're going to be 
you know, prioritizing people on the mailing list. Um, it's also where I send the weekly forecast, the one that you're listening to or watching right now in written version straight to your email and let you know about any upcoming offerings, courses, et cetera. You can also find me on Instagram at Sabrina Monarch. You see my username spelled out here, simply Sabrina Monarch. Um, beware of the general you know, trend of impersonators on Instagram of astrologers, tarot readers, et cetera. So when you see accounts that have extra letters or misspellings or extra weird punctuation, um, it's not a backup account or whatever. It's often just a scammer. So please be mindful and don't engage them. I'm not going to DM you and say, hello, beloved. Would you like a reading from me? Get on my mailing list, you know, or I mean, yeah, my mailing list is where I share the links of my bookings anyway. And then another evolutionary astrology intensive is approaching this time by a new name, Dragon of the Moon and Evolutionary Astrology Initiation. The name change comes from having been teaching this since you know, it's been five years now, um, several hundred people have run through this program or come through this program. And it's always like a very deep experience beyond what people imagined, because we're getting to intimately know these planetary beings that run through us, that we are a walking snapshot in time of the cosmos, that these planets seem to know when we're talking to them what I've realized, you know, from tracking transits over the years is that the universe seems to know when it's being observed and there's like an extra display or like there's a revealing um, that comes through when we form connections, right? So we're forming connections to planets out to Pluto. We're getting to planets that are beyond what we can see with the naked eye right? You need a telescope to physically see them. And these outer planets, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto are fairly significant within the modern astrology and evolutionary astrology traditions in that these outer planets represent forces beyond um, the, tra the transpersonal realm, essentially. Pluto is the desire nature of the soul, right? This deeper impulse within us to evolve, and this energy within us is something that we will recognize as familiar. It is intrinsic to us, but it's not our ego. It's not our personality. And so when you start to build a relationship with your desire, it starts to unravel, starts to soften the personality, allow it to become more malleable so that the way that we're acting in relationship to ourselves and to this life, we're like, finding our way into a deeper pulse, right? So this is um, like, instead of just living at a surface level or doing what you should do, or, you know, what seems like a basic reasonable thing, it's like that deeper call within about how you want to live, you know, what you're here to, who you're here to be as a soul. This is a form of astrology that I've been living alongside of since I was 21. And it's helped me helped me grow, right? It's helped me align my adult life, my way of being in the world with the deepest thing within me, which is an ongoing thing. It's not like I ever fully arrive. There's always new layers, always new initiations, always new impasses, always new breakthroughs and revelations. But I find that this, um, this map, like learning how to read the natal chart and understand the movement of the planetary bodies, um, how to relate to this as it exists within me, how to see it in other people has given me a lens to look at life that has enhanced literally every area of my life. Astrology can be connected to literally everything. And as a teacher, the way that I encourage my students to engage this practice is to form their own personal correlations to really understand these archetypes in an embodied way of how you already perceive them in your life. So you'll find that you already know the Aquarius archetype well. You might not have labeled certain things as Aquarian, but as you start to make those connections and connect these dots, it's also like portals open up to get to more deeply know the mysteries and the wisdom teachings of Aquarius, of all the other signs, all of all the planets. Um, this is an all levels program. And we really build the concepts from 
basics to more complex technique and how to put everything together. Um, it is an intimate container. I do interact with my students. We meet, um, we talk together. It's going to be late February to late June of 2023. So we'll have a good amount of time together to really get into this material and to open up this philosophical dialogue of the nature of the soul. So if you would like to apply, the link is in the notes. To learn more, you can read um, a lot of student testimonials and you can apply there. The application, um, it's the same application for people who are um, signing up to pay in full, or if you are requesting scholarship of some kind, financial aid, um, it's on that application as well. Um, and that is for um, BIPOC, that is for people who are experiencing financial hardship um, or people in third world countries. The um, scholarship um, spots are limited as well as the spots in the class are limited in general. Um, so applying sooner um, is better for your chances of getting in. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about this group um, the people that I've already talked to and the magical group that's already forming. And historically, this class has always been a really rich and beautiful experience. So I look forward to sharing that with this next cohort. I'm also going to be sharing a guided visualization, a live event on December 30th, 1 p.m. Pacific. And this is Pulse of Eros Reclaiming the Dream. And this one is about calling back stray fantasy, places where we have attached desire and meaning to particular visions, dreams, plans, trajectories, ways that we hoped things would go. And wherever we've experienced disappointment or things didn't go to our, our dream, there is a grief process, right? This happens often, say, at the end of a relationship, because even though we may know that we can move on and that um, we can have other experiences, there's a unique reality that we imagined with the other person that will not come to pass anymore. And what I've realized in my own experience of navigating, um, you know, <laughs> Saturn return over here, and this is, this is like a bitter medicine that's come through my Saturn return and also like a, um, awakening and a deepening and a profound healing that's come into my life is really taking the time to call back the stray fantasies, the places that my desire has gone off into particular channels of what I imagined or what I hoped for. And to actually really call that energy back to myself and to invest that energy in my present moment and in the life that is unfolding for me right now. Um, and so this event, a way to close out the 2022 year, I hope that you have many things to celebrate right now um, and that, you know, you're also feeling that thread. But this is a point of energetic hygiene, right? A point of calling stray parts of our desire back to center, back online so that we have them with us, that we're on the pulse of Eros, that we're not... Um, letting it slip away into these side channels um, and these places that don't offer us a return on the investment of that life force energy streaming out, leaking out into those other places. So visualization um, is a technique or a modality that I have this instinctual relationship to. It's something that I've been doing since I was a kid and I think it's really powerful. Um, and is a form of magic. I also love doing it in groups. Um, so the sign up for this is in the notes as well. Um, it's just $22. I would love to have you join me and join us in a group to be in this prayer space, this visualization space together. One last announcement before we get into the week's forecast is that I have a new interview episode of Magic of the Spheres with Lori Horvath, and we speak about um, near-death experience, spiritual initiations. Um, Lori shares a profound story um, from her life, um, and then we, we philosophize about this phenomenon with healers or teachers or guides or way showers 
of the kind of difficult or challenging experiences that one in that position might pick up and why that is, um, and some other ways to look at it besides it being, you know, some cross uh, that healers bear. It's a chirotic week, you know, based on the transit. So um, there's also um, another recent episode that I shared in Magic of the Spheres podcast. It's an introduction to Pluto, the lunar nodes, and evolutionary astrology. And that's right after this one. It's the most recent one. Okay. December 14th. The sun in 22 degrees of Sagittarius will square Neptune in 22 degrees of Pisces at 9, 10 a.m. Pacific. You know, I like to think about the sun Neptune aspects as like the little crystals that I might hang over my window and that the sunlight comes through and um, refracts out all of these rainbows all over the room. Um, it's a mystical, enchanted kind of energy. A basic pattern of manifestation is this. Thought and emotion turns into actions and actions turn into results. We see that less dense aspects of reality become more crystallized and dense. An idea turns into an object. The blueprint of a building turns into a real building, right? If you want to really get into creator consciousness, one thing that you can do is to stop having your thoughts and feelings be mostly a response to the physical reality that already exists before you. When you create thoughts and feelings for the fun of it, right? When you can create and cultivate a frequency just because you want to, um, that sets into motion realities and timelines. And so you become less, say, just reactive or responsive to what already exists. And you start to write your own codes to add into the reality. The sun in Sagittarius, so Sagittarius fire and Neptune in Pisces, Pisces water. This can relate to a visionary process of manifestation, the sun relating to this that is happening at the moment. For those on the Northern hemisphere experiencing the approach of winter, it is like the quiet snow covered sleepiness that sends us deeper into the dream world. We are in a phase of dreaming and imaging, familiarizing ourselves with feelings and impressions that will later inspire actions and plans. I love in this time of year on the Northern hemisphere, this like, enhanced dream world, like winter sleepiness, dreaminess, right? And so to just think if that's like the cauldron that we're in, um, playing with it, breathing life and fire and vision into it. Then we have Mercury in 11 degrees of Capricorn, square Chiron retrograde in 11 degrees of Aries at 9.21 p.m. Pacific, same day. At a mental level, Mercury and Capricorn could represent uh, sobriety and the, per the pursuit of getting a grip or getting it together. While the shadow of this is of course repression, the gift is cutting excess and ceasing to be indulgent in places where it is ultimately not helpful. Right, like I have a mixed relationship to the idea of getting a grip <laughs> because there's been times where that's been really important for me to you know, get a grip and other times where actually like unraveling and being a mess has been important and valuable. The square to Chiron and Aries, which can relate to wounds around personhood, the wound of feeling rejected, wounds around one's confidence or capacity to take initiative. So Mercury square that suggests that there is some tension at the moment between mental management of one's issues and the issues themselves. There could be an overall sense of feeling depressed because one lacks confidence or the presence of libido to overcome challenges and emerge victorious from hardships. There can be more than that, but those are two kind of uh, ranges of spectrum. The growing urge here for self-respect and feeling grounded in one's authority and having a mental process or making choices that reflect that may reveal that some of our attempts to get there could be renovated or reviewed a breakthrough could be at hand, 
right? So these mental processes to manage the wound um, might in themselves not even be helpful. Um, there might be a different way to go about it that creates a meaningful shift this week. So for example, we could realize that we're addicted to the story and patterning of working hard for victories. And that in doing this, we end up calling in these challenging experiences that give us the opportunity to prove ourselves. It could be appropriate to find other ways to connect with our self-esteem rather than calling in dramas that serve to invite us to prove it. Likewise, we might realize that the mental excess we go to in self-pity in feeling bad for ourselves or feeling like a victim in life, that energy could be reclaimed toward creating something valuable in our lives that might require our discipline and focus to actually get on track. In this case, taking on an, an initiation, a project worth our time, could be mentally and emotionally transformative. Capricorn relates to you know, climbing the mountain or hard work, right? And engaging a, a difficult thing, something that's hard to do. It really depends on how our system is already relating to that. Some people are burnt out, overworked, you know, they go way too hard. They have an addiction to this kind of thing. And they may be needing to learn how to unravel that. Some people um, taking on a challenge or taking on something difficult might make them more resilient. It might repurpose this like stray energy that's not like accomplishing anything or like really serving any purpose and like give it a container, give it a channel. Um, and it might be that in that process of climbing the mountain, metaphorically speaking, um, we learn all these things about ourselves or we get to experience our own becoming. And we needed that task or that mountain climb to get there. Uh, but back to my other point, in other words, the ways that we create mental strategies, conscious or not, to deal with pain or wounding could be up for some kind of shift. The Mercury Chiron square happens at the last quarter phase, which signals a crisis in consciousness as well as the potential for breakthrough. So I'll just share something with you all is that um, I've been writing these weekly forecasts for seven years, right? Um, or I've completed seven years. This is like the eighth year. And I took a lot of like sabbatical time um, in that I had gotten to a place where I was able to do that. And the thing that I felt like my soul needed was to just like go have a lot of fun and go see friends all over the world um, and just go experience myself in a different way. And one thing that I really um, sit with is that a lot of my strategy for how I've developed myself and have pursued excellence, you know, pursued like these goals, um, some of it did come from wounded places and that didn't make it worthless. Like I'm still happy with what I've accomplished. Um, but something that has really been kind of turning within me and shifting is like, the fundamental motivation that I come from and the places where I was motivated by my wounding or by my fear is now shifting more to a place of service or love uh, or enjoyment or like really service to life. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes it doesn't actually change what I'm doing, like the, um, the physical kind of products or creations that I'm making might like be the same, but my orientation or my foundation is shifting. Um, and for anyone going through a similar process, that might not be the case. Sometimes we do end up really shifting what we're doing in the external realm, as well as where we're coming from internally. Um, but yeah, I always, I've thought about this one because I, even in times in the past where um, I had these motivations of like, I feel bad about myself, so I need to do something to prove that I'm worthy. It's like I knew that that was happening, but I wasn't going to not do the, the epic task I set out for myself. It was like, this is still going to be great. And I hope that one day um, I'm able to truly come from a different place, right? And so yeah, that's what's on my mind. 
Um, I'm not sure I can tie that one up neatly for now. It's still, still a process. December 16th, 2022, we have the last quarter moon in 24 degrees of Virgo at 1256 a.m. Pacific. So Sagittarius, like every time I look at the moon, um, I'm also thinking about the sun because they are in a um, lunar cycle together. But we have the sun in Sagittarius, moon in Virgo, and that's what's forming the last quarter moon. Um, Sagittarius, where the sun is, is not as interested in details as Virgo is. Sagittarius prefers the bigger picture and seeing the whole vision. Well, it's also true that the details are part of how the vision itself is realized and executed, right? So they're very much in an interaction, but they are square. There is a tension. The moon forms a conjunction with asteroid Ceres here, which is an asteroid that relates to the myths of Demeter, Persephone, and Hades and related themes of descent into the underworld, cyclical renewal, our relationship with nourishment. In Virgo, nourishment can be found in the details. Consider if there is an internal disagreement between the mundane details and the daily routines of life, and if they feel mundane, um, and a grander sense of purpose and vision. Is one being neglected over the other? Right? Or do we feel like we're in the monotony and we can't see the vision? Or are we in the vision, but we're not manifesting it in a real way because we're not paying attention to the details that would execute it? So as we think about the balance between these two, Sagittarius and Virgo, this could lead us to pause our busyness of activity and find a moment of connection with spirit. Or likewise, to descend down from the clouds and take care of items on our to-do list that we've been neglecting. I, you know, I have Jupiter in Virgo. Um, and one thing that I notice sometimes is that my, um, you know, you may not, you may know this about me from like my art and novels and stuff, but I, I have some moody moon Pluto qualities. And um, sometimes when I'm in this kind of bleak emotional state, like I realize that there's things like little to-do list tasks that I'm not doing because I don't feel connected to in that moment to a greater sense of purpose. I'm just like in a mood. And sometimes it's actually just chop wood, carry water, doing those little tasks that starts to brighten my outlook. And I start to see um, that as I've gotten energy moving by taking care of those little details, that life itself starts to open up and things start to move. But I've realized um, generally that a bad mood is not a reason to let the earth plane in my life go to waste, right? To like let the dishes pile up and to let the apartment get super messy um, and to neglect my responsibilities, right? That there is just a basic level of discipline or reverence in maintaining those tasks. Not that I don't like go take breaks or go do other things, but just noticing that I think with Sagittarius and Virgo, it's like noticing that clash between our spirits, Sagittarius, like, oh, that sense of buoyancy. And then all these little details and the meticulous qualities of life um, and how they actually do inform each other, right? Like, and so just noticing where those two forces, like how they're interacting in your life and how you might be more playful and creative with, you know, keeping your spirits lifted and buoyant and also keeping momentum in like the little practical things. Um, another way to look at it too is how there is like a meticulous science or process around like the spirit um, as well so that you can find the magic in the mundane or see that those two things are not actually very separate. The last quarter moon in Virgo could also serve as a checkpoint to meditate and align with feeling the grander vision in our life fractally in the small moments so that we are less myopic about our destination and more present with the entire journey there, right? No no extensive future tripping, right? Where we kind of like cut ourselves off from some kind of joy that we picture in the future, but to actually like really bring that down to each small moment and start to see that the way that we're living now is creating a pattern and a ripple effect. And so that when we bring the magic 
down to the smallest details, there's a really, you know, that's a tidal wave of energy that we're creating. December 17th, Mercury in 15 degrees of Capricorn will try and Uranus retrograde in 15 degrees of Taurus at 1.36 p.m. Pacific. Mercury first contacted the asteroid Chiron related to wounding and healing and now contacts a planet related to trauma, breakthrough, genius, and the higher mind. We can think of Uranus like a nervous system, how trauma can hijack the system, or an event can trigger a thread related to trauma, right? And then we're like fried or like nervy versus how free or open or receptive we might be to channeling frequencies or stations of consciousness, right? Like accessing the higher mind, the Akashic records, the library of possibilities, different stations. How we have practices or tools to tune our nervous system, to tune the mind, to access different states of being. The Mercury Uranus connection and Earth signs could allude to pragmatic activities that we engage to create harmony in the various systems we're embedded in, such as our own nervous system, our relationship to the ecosystem, our relationship with social systems or groupthink, to name a few. The trine here could also relate to the relative ease at which we stay stagnant in our patterns and the choice or intention that is involved in breaking the pattern. I recognize this in myself at times that I'm looping over something or I'm not really in a great state of being. And when I feel a resistance to changing my state, even though I have many tools to be able to do so, like the part of me that actually just wants to simmer and stew, like in the thing. Eventually, I become curious about what kind of life I could have if I said yes to the opening to life instead. Um, and this becomes the practice to notice these stagnant states, right? We're thinking about Taurus here in terms of like embedded, um, cultivated patterns that could also be stagnant. Um, and to kind of code switch in those moments of I know how to do some kind of breath work practice or, or something, right? And I feel like I often will just have like many caveats or different possibilities here, but sometimes um, when something is really intense for me, I will like stew in it for a bit and like really like let it turn into lead. Um, and sometimes I feel like a deeper impulse. Like I remember there was one day where I just let myself be depressed for like the whole day. It was like, wasn't even trying to feel better until at the very end of the day, I was like, you know, I just need to be having more fun. And I had this idea that I wanted to go to Miami and I called up two of my friends and we like planned a trip and went to Miami. And it was, it was amazing that trip, but it came from this like weird compressed day of being like super depressed and then having this light bulb moment. So I will kind of decide when it feels valuable to just sit in the funk, you know, but other times it could be like, you know, I need to move this energy. I'm in a mood. Let me like move my body, do some breath work, do EFT tapping, like use the tools I have to actually just shift my frame of mind. So we might notice the moments that we're engaged in a type of consciousness that is like a stuffy room. What would it mean to go outside for a walk or to open the window, metaphorically speaking, or literally? When we free ourselves, what is the ripple effect? What inspirations do we set into motion? The power again of small things, because doing this over and over again, shifting our state, elevating our state, creates new neural pathways and habits and a life. Then we have Ceres in 29 degrees of Virgo, opposite Jupiter and 29 degrees of Pisces. So we have them at the ends of their signs. 9.51 p.m. Pacific. At times we feel a split between the magic and the mundane or a split between the high dream and ideal of our lives versus the monotony of an everyday that doesn't reflect that vision. The more agonized we are by this, we can be prone to addiction and fantasy as a way of chasing the high or trying to feed that desire for magic. 
As a point of feeling truly nourished, we may consider how we bridge these realms, how we find ceremony and magic in the everyday, how we infuse inspiration into our lives. What are the small steps, Virgo, that we can take to get there? What is the portal available at any given moment? Then as a practice or a way of life, many steps combined, we see reality shape in conversation with the way we've mused it through many small actions. And then December 18th series, after that opposition to Jupiter, we'll enter Libra at 3.27 p.m. Pacific. And we'll stay in Libra until September 15th, 2023, right? These asteroids are in between, they're like in an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So they do have fairly long um, cycles. They don't move as quick as say like Mercury or Venus. Ceres and Libra could bring up themes around how reciprocity nourishes us or where our misguided relationship with reciprocity pulls us under into emotional underworlds. You know what I'm talking about too, you know, where like real reciprocity feels so nourishing, but when the balance is off, there is a kind of pull under, right? Like Ceres is about our relationship with nourishment, as well as that kind of energy of feeling like that pull into the underworld. And when we kind of, or when we successfully make it through the initiation, we find our power in the underworld. We find like the parts of ourselves that live there and we reclaim them. And we have this capacity to go between the realms, like to live on the above world and to descend, to be in relationship with the cycles of nature, the cycles of our um, psyche. And in terms of reciprocity pulling us under, we could think of the basic um, unrequited love situation of like feeding so much like courtship and energy to a person and them not responding. It's like, there's a certain pain and that would, you know, maybe take the person who's in the courtship space under to kind of feel into the depth of those feelings, right? And the sense that um, if we're feeling like there isn't a dynamic give and receive or exchange in our lives in some area, there's a way that we might also think about how we're participating in that, like how we're either withholding or how we're over giving. Reciprocity as nourishment could mean how we discover the ways in which being of service or offering our gifts and energy into ecosystems around us actually taps us into a higher quality of life, not just for the way it improves our relationships, but for all the ways we are also fed and nourished by these relationships. It is a different approach to think of how we can be of service rather than how we can extract and get from life. And so when we think about reciprocity, we are also talking about our relationship with planets, right? Like a lot of people talk about transits as like, what's this ideal time? And like trying to kind of map out how the transits are going to serve us, right? That's a way of looking at it as opposed to how am I going to gift something to the planets? What am I going to offer them? Same for plants, land, spirits. Uh, place, etc. Reciprocity as a pull into an emotional underworld could be like when we are strategic about giving to the point, or sorry, when we're strategic about giving to the point that we expect certain things in return from certain sources, being very transactional and rigid. It's fair to have boundaries and desires in relationship and to recognize like when things are are just not a match. But where is our interpretation of balance or how things should be in balance off and then a cause of suffering? Consider along this vein, the energetic of the ways that people hold back their gift, hold back themselves, the deep thing inside of them from life itself because of a mental calculation of what's in it for them right? Or like, I'm scared to be myself. And then life responds as well by withholding. 
The opposite side of this pendulum is overgiving, overextending oneself, and not having energy or resources left for one's own needs. All right, the Libra scales can tip to either extreme. Reciprocity as nourishment. Think about it deeper than what maybe is obvious. Like, let it be simple. But I think there might be something, you know, at least approach it from the heart. December 19th, Venus in 11 degrees of Capricorn will square Chiron retrograde in 11 degrees of Aries at 8.23 a.m. Pacific. This echoes the Mercury in Capricorn, Chiron in Aries square detailed above or in the past in this video. Um, and that it is also a last quarter phase square Mercury, Chiron, Venus and Chiron, last quarter phase, which indicates crisis in consciousness and the potential for breakthrough. With Venus and Capricorn, we are looking at our pragmatism in love and the ways this serves connection and the healing that naturally comes from connection. Or if our vision of pragmatism in love is a perpetuation of the wounds that we're seeking to protect ourselves from, right? Like when we're in these egoic control patterns in relationship in order to not get hurt, but we're not actually opening our heart to the transformative power of love in that, right? Versus like when we are being truly pragmatic in love and like doing something to help create a foundation um, that will serve the longevity um, of the connection or the integrity of the connection. Not all connections are um forever per se but there can be a way that we we do it right or we show up in integrity there may also be a dynamic about the ways we engage boundaries in relationship around our energy time commitment etc in relationship to our needs around sovereignty and independence chiron and aries there could be something here around healing the unnecessary pain that we create in ourselves and in our relationships when we polarize purpose and love. The two can vie for time and energy, but there may be a breakthrough at hand in how to relate to the dynamic and how we can see them as supporting each other or what changes we might need to make in our lives accordingly. Right, like something when I was thinking about that is like, what if someone's so busy with their purpose, that they view relationships as distractions. Low quality relationships, relationships that drain us might be that. Um, but let's say it's just a mental program at some point or a conditioning where there's just some kind of internal tension of like, um, when we feel victimized by the boundaries that we need around our time, or energy to create, and then we villainize the person who is the interruption to that boundary, which is wholly unnecessary, right? Like Venus in Capricorn makes boundaries sexy. It's like when we um, give others the space that they need to thrive, and we are able to claim what we need to thrive. And where there's an unnecessary polarization in our relationships, by that kind of scarcity around time or energy, is something that I would think about as like a little pain point slash um, place of healing this week with the Venus and Capricorn, Chiron and Aries square, where it's like Chiron and Aries is having that kind of like defensive, like <laughs> I need my sovereignty or like that feels like under attack or like there's something there for Chiron and Aries. And Venus and Capricorn is like, well, how can we figure this out responsibly and allot the needed resources and time so that everyone here feels valued and cared for, even if it means that something might be slower um, or like the actual plan might be different or more on the ground than some like lofty ideal where everything is possible at any time. Like Capricorn will bring in limitations, but there may be a way that actually feeling into that um, we feel good. Like an example I can also think of too, is like, um, when there's a part of us that's just like, I want to do what I want. Like I, 
feel like eating this thing, right? That like, I know I'm not even going to like feel that great after or something. And that it may feel less thrilling to a part of the self to like go eat something else. that's like a little bit more nourishing and grounding and like has nutrients. But then when we do it, we feel good. We feel self-esteem. We feel nourished. Um, we feel like we value ourselves because we made a choice that feels resonant, right? We did something that felt like responsible. Um, so however that looks, and there's a variety of different things, situationally dependent. Um, and I was talking here originally about polarizing love and purpose. I just think there may be something around, um, having a more heart centered and yet responsible approach to something where we might otherwise be kind of immature or victimized um, in relationship. And then we have Mars retrograde in 11 degrees of Gemini, sextile Chiron retrograde in 11 degrees of Aries at 2.38 p.m. Pacific. At the time of this sextile, Mars and Chiron form a yod to the moon, the south node and the asteroid psyche all in Scorpio. So this to me looked like some release, letting go of toxins that show up in our inner worlds as obsessions, resentments, and psychological or emotional addictions. Mars retrograde has likely been putting us in contact with frustrations, triggers, um, events, things that have heated our system up and shown us where we feel thwarted, unable to move or act as we'd like, or haunted by anxieties, thoughts, and perspectives that notably are creating distress for us. So what if we had a perspective shift that these frustrations that are swirling around in our field are being flushed out and purged? The yacht is pointing to the south node, a release point. Um, and we facilitated that somehow, right? And Again, moon Pluto life, <laughs> being prone to obsession at times. Sometimes I notice that the things that I'm like really swirling around, it's like they're on their way out. I can get attached to them and think that there's something that is part of me, um, but it's like they're heating up and there's some kind of alchemy that's occurring. And I just really feel that with the Mars Chiron sextile yod to the south node with the moon and psyche there. It just feels like there's some frustration, some level of heat, and it's revealing where we just need to let something go. Something that we've been like really emotionally fixated on and it's hurting and it's time to like release it. Release and letting go is also an art. You know, if it was easier, we would do it more easily, but it's actually challenging. Um, and so there's technologies, there's things that support it. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, the Scorpio school of alchemy. Um, but consider as well, like the tools that you already have, um, for release, um, because part of it is also our willpower to simply engage in that way. And then December 20th, Jupiter re-enters Aries. I'm excited about that. Um, at 6.32 a.m. Pacific, Jupiter was last in Aries May, 10, May 10th of 2022 to October 28th. It retrograded back into Pisces and it is now re-entering Aries and will be here until May 16th of 2023. Um, and I will be leaving a link in the notes to an episode um, interview that I did with SJ Anderson, where we talked about Jupiter and Aries at depth, getting into both Jupiter as an archetype um, and the sign of Aries and then putting it together. It was a pretty revelatory conversation and I'm excited to bring it back. So this is what I have for you this week. Um, again, like this video, subscribe and leave a comment literally just to say hello. Like it's actually really supportive for the channel when you leave a comment. Um, I also love to hear from you. So let me know what you think, how you're experiencing the transits, what resonated with you from this video, anything that you'd like to share. And do check out Dragon of the Moon, um, learn more about it, apply if you're feeling called to study astrology with me. Um, and I also would love to see you for Pulse of Eros at the end of this month to close off the year with a little bit of energetic hygiene, bringing more of our desire back online um, to affirm that life is happening now and to be back on the Pulse of Eros. So this is all I have for you. Um, I will be back again soon. and. 
I hope that you have a beautiful week.